College of Agriculture. And to celebrate, the College of Agriculture is uh, beginning a series, a year-long series of lectures honoring uh, distinguished people. And each one of these lectures is going to have a little vignette about the person being honored by the lecture. And this week we had three lectures, including the Bessie Lecture and tonight's uh, Arrington Memorial Lecture. Um, so, so again, welcome. This is part of the annual Arrington Lecture. Can you believe this is the 43rd time we've done this at Iowa State? And uh, you can look in your programs tonight and see the long list of distinguished folks who have done, done something uh, good for wildlife or good for conservation. And um, as part of tonight's proceedings, we do want to thank our sponsors and heartfelt thanks to all our sponsors, which are listed on the front of your programs. And so instead of a reading the entire list, I'll just refer you to that, the front of your program. Among the most steadfast supporters of this lecture series has been Paul Arrington's wife, Carolyn Arrington. Carolyn, won't you stand or just at least give us a wave so that we can recognize you. Paul Arrington um, grew up on the family farm in South Dakota, and one of his... Uh, closest friends said that he was intensely curious about free living wild creatures and he was extraordinarily sensitive to beauty in the out of doors. When he was a young man, he was about 16 years of age, he asked his mom, please mom, I can hear him saying, pleading, can I go north and spend the winter trapping in northern Minnesota? And like any good mother, she said, are you out of your mind? No way. But two years later, when he, at the age of 18, I believe, he was up north spending the winter sleeping under a huge pile of blankets interspersed with newspapers. It was so cold in northern Minnesota. And from that early experience, from his early experiences growing up on the family farm, uh, wandering around out there on the marshes and out in nature, I think he really latched on to what today we would call the natural history tradition. Endless hours of observation out in nature. And so he really spanned two worlds along the span of his career from the natural history tradition to quantitative science. It's significant that when Aldo Leopold sent out his manuscript for what would become the, the birth of game management, or the book called uh, Game Management, when he sent it out for review, he sent one of those manuscripts to Paul Arrington and five other scientists for review and comments. So Paul Arrington was right there at the creation of today's science and practice of wildlife management. In 1932, Paul Arrington came to Iowa State, or Iowa, Col Iowa State College back then, to organize the, the nation's first federally funded cooperative wildlife research unit, very important institution in American, for, for American wildlife. And it was a formative period, and to put it politely, uh, as he organized the unit, there was some details to be worked out. And so there was little discussions with the, between the dean and the department chair, and, uh, and so it was a very formative period for the co-op units. Paul Arrington is, should be noted and should be more widely recognized for his role in science and as a scientist. There's three things he did that I want to mention tonight briefly. First of all, he, his work involved population cycles. And he worked uh, quite a bit with Bob White Quail. And there was a national discussion going on. Guys like Herbert Stoddard down in Georgia. Arrington was a very important uh, person in this national conversation and formed a very important connection with the hunting community. And um, I don't know if this might sound familiar, but there was a real rift back then between the hunters and the preservationists, uh, a rift in the conservation community. And Arrington was really careful and cautious, and he didn't jump on either bandwagon. He said, let's go out there and get the data and find out what's really going on. The second thing Paul Arrington did 
uh, was to redefine the meaning of predation. And there is a technical sense here, but there's a larger cultural sense here, and that's why I'm using these words. He redefined the meaning of predation. Back then there was honest fears that a predator could entirely destroy a game population. Arrington wrote, people confuse the fact of predation with the effect of predation. And he went on to write that among the so-called vermin are the most beautiful and interesting creatures in North America. And so what he did was to explain for people the predator's role, uh, the predator's perfectly natural role in population <laughs> regulation, both in a scientific sense and then in a more in popular sense, because he was wrote for various audiences. Third, uh, Paul Arrington worked with the idea of comp compensatory mortality. And Aldo Leopold said, it was the scientific explanation for why we can hunt at all. Finally, and last, well, I have a couple more slides here. This is, a, this is Paul Arrington, of course, on the left. And on the right is one of his favorite uh, objects of study, the muskrat. And uh, rumor has it that he, he would rather be out in the marsh than at a faculty meeting. <laughs> I wonder if that rumor is true. <laughs> Finally, uh, Paul Arrington was also significant in the development of the modern conservation movement. <coughs> like Leopold, he wrote essays addressing the interaction between humans and nature. He was an advocate for wetlands, offering reasons to appreciate wetlands. He was really forward-looking at a time when the, all the momentum was still geared toward draining uh, the remaining wetlands of North America. In 1957, he wrote and published, or published anyway, a book called Of Men and Marshes. And that's where he makes his more eloquent statements about the values of marshes to people. And, and from that book, here's a, one of the beautiful illustrations by Albert Hochbaum, who uh, these beautiful kinds of illustrations throughout that book. Let me read just a couple of quotes from this book. Arrington saw uh, wildlife values, well, this is not a quote yet. First of all, Arrington saw values in the wetlands, but it was in a very broad sense as a biological community. He noted that the first mistake of wildlife management was the cleaning up and doctoring of places that should be left alone. And I think it's really interesting that in Midwestern marshes, in the midst of a profoundly modified landscape, Arrington saw wilderness qualities. He suggested that glacial march marshes, here's the quote, comprise their own form of wilderness. They have their own life-rich genuineness and reflect forces that are much older, much more permanent, and much mightier than man. Arrington recognized that wetlands contributed to human values. So he wasn't just focusing on the wildlife, but he also was thinking about humans, humans and nature, here in the Midwest. He suggested that marshes, he wrote, could add greatly to human enjoyment if more people really knew them the year around. I believe there would be more interest in marshes if more people appreciated how interesting and beautiful marshes are as marshes. And certainly he went out to a, as not only a scientific audience, but to a popular audience with that book of Men and Marshes. The Wildlife Society honored Paul Arrington not once, and this is unusual, but twice for outstanding publications. In 1962, the Wildlife Society awarded Arrington the Aldo Leopold Medal for achievement and service to wildlife conservation. So thanks for joining us tonight for the Arrington Memorial Lecture that honors the accomplishments uh, and the contributions of Paul Arrington. And now, to introduce tonight's uh, speaker, I introduce Paul uh, Jim Miller. <laughs> Thanks, James. Yeah. Well, there's uh, a lot of biographical information in the program, uh, but let me hit some of the highlights for our speaker tonight. John Weens grew up in Oklahoma and developed a strong interest in birding at the age of eight or nine. And I found out today that he spent most of his teenage years in the company of 
essentially juvenile delinquents, um, <laughs> leather jacketed uh, teenagers in an attempt to recover some of the cool that he'd lost by being an avid birder uh, for, a, for a young boy. Not really looked upon as being something cool to do with your time. He did his undergraduate work at the University of Oklahoma and he also got his master's degree there. Got his PhD at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. He worked with John Emlin. Uh, and he, he's had a remarkable career in academia, beginning with his first faculty position at Oklahoma State University and then on to New Mexico State University and finally Colorado State University. His research, which has emphasized landscape ecology and the ecology of birds and insects in arid environments, has resulted in over 200 scientific papers and seven <coughs> books, most recently foundation papers in landscape ecology. John has received numerous honors and prestigious awards, including the title of University Distinguished Professor at Colorado State, and he was granted a Fulbright Senior Fellowship to work at the University of Sydney. John left academia in 2002. In fact, uh, it wasn't lost on me that it was soon after serving as my major advisor that he left academia. <laughs> <laughs> I assume that was a coincidence, John. Um, but to embark, uh, not to retire, but to embark on a second career with the Nature Conservancy as lead scientist, where he's responsible for developing and helping to implement science-based conservation throughout the Nature Conservancy and forging new linkages with partners, including federal agencies, other NGOs, and multinational institutions. Uh, please join me in welcoming our 2007 Arrington lecturer, John Weens. Thank you, Jim. Uh, it's great to be here in warm, sunny Iowa. Uh, and it's really quite an honor to be giving the Paul Arlington Lecture. Uh, I was mentioning to someone that uh, when I was a graduate student, I was not really involved with wildlife programs. I was in behavior and ecology and hadn't really encountered anything about Paul Arrington or his work. Shortly after I finished my PhD, I moved to Oregon State and somehow got on the, the list of book reviewers for bioscience and uh, was asked to write a review of Arrington's book on predation and life, uh, which I did. So in, in preparation for this uh, talk, I looked back at both the book and my review and it was very interesting with the perspective of uh, a good number of years, I'm not going to say how many, uh, to see you know, what I was saying in the review and what the book was saying and how it had lost none of the timeliness that it had at that point. The issues that were being addressed in that book are issues that we address today. We attach different labels to them. We've come up with much more eloquent and obtuse jargon that uh, Arrington was not uh, privileged to be able to use, but the basic messages were much the same. So I think that there's, there's real timeliness there, and I'm, I'm really honored to be able to uh, give you a talk tonight. What I'd like to do is to uh, chart a very biased perspective of the evolution of conservation, which really is going to not be a detailed historical tour through the, the people and the places that have shaped conservation. But really, just to highlight uh, a few things about it. And let me see if I can master the, no, I can't master, I, this always happens to me, let's see. No. It's not doing what they said it would do. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll this. Uh, <laughs> okay, so much for uh, technology. Uh, the roots of conservation really lie in the natural historians of the 19th 
20th century. Uh, people like Thoreau, John Muir, of course, Aldo Leopold. These were the people who shaped what has now become conservation. And it was rooted, therefore, firmly in natural history and various outgrowths of that, wildlife, biology, ecology, not something that at that time would have been recognized as conservation. I think no less among these is, is Paul Arrington. And here's a quote from some of Paul Arrington's uh, work, which I will read to you because <coughs> you know, that reinforces it. We should be able to think of wildernesses extending beyond highways, of barren grounds and ice fields and deserts and unlogged forests and untrampered lakes and streams. We should know of marshes with sandhill cranes and the more retiring of water birds, of rivers where otters live, of mountains where martins, fishers, wolverines, cougars, wolves, grizzly bears, and native sheep and goats exist in some security. That really is a, is a statement from uh, a natural historian's perspective of what conservation was about then and what it is still about today. As conservation developed over the years and began to be formalized, the initial focus was on species, on things like Galapagos tortoises, Nene in Hawaii, Astragalus in the Klamath Basin of, of Oregon, particularly species that were threatened, rare, endangered, imperiled, either officially or unofficially in some way. And attendant with that, there developed the science to deal with these. So conservation science really had its beginning <coughs> with a focus on species. And it's been very successful. A huge amount of science that is devoted to looking at the demography of these species, metapopulation dynamics, dispersal, population genetics, characterizing the habitat, looking at the prey base, the sort of intensive single species studies that the natural historians were carrying on, which have continued now to be applied to the conservation of species on a species by species basis. At the same time that the focus on species was developing, there was also a, a, an emphasis upon places, and particularly this emphasis was been, has been fostered by the Nature Conservancy. This is one of the most recent iterations of sort of the byline that the conservation that the Nature Conservancy uses to uh, capture in a succinct phrase something that they feel will appeal to donors <laughs> enough to give them money. Uh, but it is really what the Conservancy has been about for more than 50 years. Saving places, whether they are the last great places on Earth or some pretty good places in Iowa or whatever it might be. <laughs> and the question then becomes, how do we save these last great places? How do we bring science to bear on that? We can articulate the conservation problem. Where are the places that we need to protect in order to preserve biodiversity on Earth? And the way this has been approached by the Nature Conservancy, by other organizations, is to develop conservation plans that are soundly framed on conservation science, and from that, take conservation actions of various sorts, a very logical kind of framework. I want to go through a little bit of what this planning process is, is like in the Nature Conservancy, because it represents, in a sense, one version of where conservation practice is today. In the Nature Conservancy um, and in other organizations, conservation is based not on political boundaries but on eco-regional boundaries. And these are the eco-regions of the United States, a modification of Bailey's <coughs> eco-regions. And here's a, a blow up of these eco-regions for the northeastern United States. They're defined by shared ecological characteristics in a broad sense. Within these eco-regions, the central Appalachian forest, for example, there is um, a fairly rigorous and involved process of conservation planning that ends up with the identification of a number of conservation areas. One of these is shown here. Those define the areas in which activities will be focused. These are areas that, when one looks at the aggregate of conservation areas within an ecoregion, they do an adequate, if not the best job, of capturing the full spectrum of biodiversity that is representative of those ecoregions. 
And those then are the target areas within which conservation actions will be applied. And here are two TNC preserves that are located within this particular conservation area. Here are other kinds of protected areas that are in the same uh, general area. And when we do this over the United States as a whole, this is what it looks like. All of these dark green areas are these conservation areas that have been developed through this process of eco-regional planning. So this, in a sense, is the blueprint for the conservancy of where conservation actions of uh, land protection, land restoration, land and water protection ought to be focused uh, to achieve maximum conservation results. It doesn't mean necessarily that we don't do any work in the lighter green areas, but organizationally, if a program proposes to do work in those light green areas, it is much harder to justify that because we've gone through a process that has prioritized this area. It doesn't mean by any means that our objective is to place all of these areas under complete protection. It simply means that those are the areas within which we focus our conservation activities. So this is a science-based process that has helped us identify not just the last great places, but a, a portfolio of places in which conservation investments are likely to yield the greatest return in terms of biodiversity. This is just the United States. And we need to think more globally about how do we set priorities for global conservation. These are the eco-regions of the world. And we obviously can't go through the same kind of arduous process of planning for each of those hundreds and hundreds of eco-regions throughout the world. We need to adopt a different approach. And in fact, there are a number of organizations that have tried to look at this. IUCN has cataloged the areas that are already under some form of protection. This is simply a, a slice of South America showing the protected areas in this area. And protection, you have to realize, as you move outside the, U the United States, or even within the United States, means various things. In many of these protected areas, there are people and communities actively living and using and extracting resources from those areas. Poaching goes on in many of these areas. Protection frequently internationally means only that there is an administrative line that is drawn around some place on a map, and that does not translate to any form of protection on the ground in reality. So the protect if you read statistics about the proportion of the world that is under conservation protection, you'll discover that more than 10% of the land area in the world is already under some form of conservation protection. That doesn't mean that it's effectively protected. It's far less than that. Those are the paper parks. Um, various organizations have various approaches to trying to prioritize where conservation should occur. Um, conservation International and other organizations focus on hot spots of biodiversity. Areas that if, if, we, if conservation efforts are concentrated in these areas, they will achieve the maximum result in terms of the total biodiversity, the numbers of species that are protected. One can argue back and forth about whether this is an appropriate approach, whether it is appropriate to base such calculations primarily upon catalogs of plant species diversity or plant plus bird species diversity. Uh, but you'll notice that the overwhelming majority of those areas are tropical and subtropical, which means if you follow this, that that's where most of the conservation investments <coughs> ought to be made. The Nature Conservancy is adopting a, a philosophically different approach by essentially saying that we want globally to aim to protect biode representative biodiversity across the globe, throughout the Earth, which means that high latitude Arctic areas, that deserts, that areas that have low species richness, that are cold spots of biodiversity in a sense, merit as much conservation attention as those that are rich in species. And we do this by identifying major habitat types here, shown in different colors, and partitioning those by biogeographic realm. Uh, and the partitioning by, by biogeographic realms is to ensure that when we 
protect, for example, uh, temperate grasslands, that we don't focus all of our attention in Mongolia and think we've done a great job of protecting temperate grasslands because we've protected a lot of them in Mongolia. It's important to protect them in Mongolia, but Patagonia is also important. North America is important. Parts of Australia are important. Let me give you a sort of a, a hierarchical uh, tour of how this relates to what I was talking about before. This is the central tall grass prairie uh, uh, <coughs> ecoregion. And within that, these green areas represent those conservation areas that have been identified through this process of ecoregional planning. One of these is the Arikari site in uh, northeastern Colorado, uh, a prairie area that is protected as uh, a working ranch. Uh, but this central tall grass, uh, central short grass prairie in Colorado is only one of a whole series of temperate grassland ecoregions within North America, and the Central Valley of California is also one of these. And those are only part of the global distribution of temperate grasslands, which occur in a number of areas throughout the world. And we can moreover look at these and use various algorithms to calculate the degree to which they are under risk. <coughs> risk being defined primarily in terms of the degree of conversion through cultivation. This is from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment and illustrates the degree to which uh, areas have been converted into cultivation, at least 30% of the landscape cultivated uh, on a global basis. And it maps very closely with the distribution of temperate grasslands, which as you know well here in Iowa, have largely been converted to various forms of cropland cultivation. We can expand beyond the, the beyond one particular habitat type, temperate grasslands, and look at a whole series across the globe at the whole array of habitat types, and then categorize these in terms of the degree to, that they are um, crisis ecoregions, ecoregions in which the risk of losing the current conservation gains are the greatest. So if we have 8% of a particular habitat type in a particular ecoregion under some form of protection, what are the risks of losing some of that protection through changes in land use, through changes in policy, through uh, political turmoil, whatever? And this map shows across the globe the areas in which uh, conservation protection in ecoregions is under greatest risk. That in the, that's another way of indicating where across the globe should we allocate our conservation efforts. We can't work everywhere. No one can work everywhere. But it's a good idea to have some kind of logical framework, uh, ideally a science-based framework, to determine where, in fact, one ought to put the efforts first. And there are a variety of, of layers of information you can use to make these decisions. Here for tropical moist broadleaf forests, in the, in the neotropics, are the kind of the, this is a map of those ecoregions, and here they are color coded according to the biological significance, essentially a measure of the species richness, but a weighted measure of species richness. Here they are coded in terms of the current habitat condition, a measure of, of land conversions, of fragmentation of existing habitat. Here, they are color-coded according to the risk of those biodiversity, the risk due to development, to changing land use, to cultivation, and so on. Here, the countries are categorized according to their enabling conditions, uh, socio, uh, sociological conditions, economic conditions, political stability, uh, things of that sort. Here are those crisis ecoregions again. Here is the level to which our eco-regional planning process has been completed in these various areas so that we have that additional information to guide us. So one can begin to combine information like this to target those areas, those places in which you drill down then to a more local level, to those conservation areas, to the specific areas that one might protect within those to achieve the greatest returns on conservation investment of particular habitat types on a global basis. 
It's taken the notion of nature preserves many steps beyond the uh, initial pretty places that characterized, for example, what the Nature Conservancy did 25 or 30 years ago to put it in a much stronger empirical foundation and to expand the scope from uh, the domestic to the global. This is all well and good, but I think over the last decade or so, more and more people working in conservation have come to the realization that simply by protecting areas is not going to address the biodiversity crisis. It doesn't solve the problem. We will never be able to put a sufficient amount of land, a sufficient amount of habitat under protection to ensure the persistence of the biodiversity that we want to protect. We have to include areas where people are acting, where people are living and working as part of the conservation equation. This, for example, is a Google Earth image of the boundary of Olympia National Park in Washington. You can see quite clearly the park boundary here with all the clear cuts on one side of it and undisturbed habitat on the other. This is happening all over uh, the world. Human activities are encroaching to the edges and into these protected areas. We can fight that, but we'll not be ultimately successful in doing so and it is naive to ignore the conservation value of the areas outside the park. So as we move forward, as we move from protection of species and the species focus to a focus on protected areas in and of themselves, the focus is shifting more and more to protected areas in a broader context and to the conservation value of those areas in which people do live and work. And if you are a member of the Nature Conservancy and you receive the Nature Conservancy magazine, there was a subtle shift in the focus of the magazine over the last year that not very many people really noticed, but it was very intentional. A shift from the typical kind of cover of the magazine that depicts last great places, pretty places, places that are going to have the visual appeal that goes with conserving places, to a focus that includes people. People now appear on the cover of the magazine. And not only that, but people living outside the United States. This represents a fundamental shift in the focus of conservation, not just within the Nature Conservancy, but within conservation in general. A shift to encompass people and their activities and for the Conservancy to focus more globally than we have in the past. Because the issues, after all, are not local. They are not regional. They are, in fact, global issues of conservation. What this means is that traditionally, conservation focused on this pristine end of the spectrum between pristine landscapes and totally trashed landscapes. I'm not suggesting that we treasure and value this sort of landscape, but we need to expand the spectrum to cover a broader array, these intermediate areas that involve ongoing human activities, but nonetheless have conservation values, and to find that sweet spot, in a sense, in which human activities are compatible with biodiversity and vice versa. Let me give you an example from one of uh, the nature conservancy preserves in Texas, the Texas City Prairie Preserve. It's a small preserve. It's located in Texas City, Texas. This is the area of the preserve. These are oil refineries. These are oil refineries. There's some more over here. Texas City is the hotbed. Uh, that's the hot spot for oil refining in, in the country. And we have a preserve, a prairie preserve. It's located within it. Here you can see the preserve. It's suitable for coyotes, and there are all the oil refineries in the background. This place is of interest because it is the one of two places in the world in which Atwater's prairie chicken still exist. Uh, aside from the recent rediscovery of ivory bill woodpeckers, Atwater's prairie chicken is arguably the most endangered bird species in, in continental North America. It occurs in two places now. Formerly, the range was much larger. Uh, one of them is the TNC Preserve. The other is the Atwater Prairie Chicken National Wildlife Refuge in Texas. Uh, um, here are the numbers 
for the population at Texas City. 16 birds were present in 1995 when uh, Exxon, when Mobile Oil Corporation, uh, perhaps sensing the future difficulties that this might pose for them, donated the land and 16 prairie chickens to the Nature Conservancy. And we now have responsibility for these birds. Peak population occurred a few years later. The bird populations are maintained through captive breeding and release of captive bred birds. There are still a few birds at the TNC Preserve that are wild-bred birds that are not from introduction, uh, but as of the last count, only two. <coughs> the population has fluctuated, but the latest count of a few weeks ago showed only eight birds present in the population of Texas City. I should point out that this preserve is on the edge of the Gulf of Mexico, the average elevation of the Texas City Prairie is about a meter above sea level, uh, quite apart from anything that sea level rise might do to this. Uh, there were some hurricanes a couple of years ago that passed directly through this area, uh, which certainly would have wiped out the birds had not the TNC staff gone in in advance of the, of the hurricane, captured all the prairie chickens, put them in a truck, <coughs> transported them inland, and then brought them back and released them once the prairie, uh, once the hurricanes were passed. Uh, I mention this because it is a it's a single species focus for a protected area, but it's also a protected area in which there are various human activities go on. There's cattle grazing on the preserve, and the cattle grazing is necessary partly to maintain the the local. Uh, leverage the local relationships uh, with people in Texas to show that in fact the prairie is being used as it ought to be used, but partly because the cattle clear areas that the prairie chickens are then able to use as display grounds, as their lecking grounds. Um, it's also uh, the site of oil extraction. Uh, there's oil drilling that goes on in this preserve, and this has caused us no small amount of of uh, public relations difficulty. You know, how could TNC be drilling for oil on one of our own preserves? Well, we're drilling for oil on it because the uh, oil is an underground resource over which we have no control. We have no rights to that. We only have surface ownership. And in fact, the release agreements in place long before the land was transferred to us that granted drilling rights. So what we've done is to try to to make sure that the drilling activities occur at a time of year and in parts of the preserve that will cause minimal impact to the birds. And in fact, all evidence indicates that the birds don't even know that there's oil activity going on there. But nonetheless, the public image of this is remarkably bad unless you're in Texas, in which case people say, what's the problem? <laughs> So human activities occur on these, but human activities occur as well around the, the preserves. And I think another <coughs> direction in which conservation is, is headed that is part of this broadening view to look beyond the protected areas is to look at the surrounding landscape, to look at the land cover that occurs there. This is the map I showed you before of a conservation area, a couple of TNC preserves, and this red area is, is, is an area that was recently proposed for purchase by TNC. Um, and it, now it's a little bit within that conservation area, so it's probably okay. But it was argued that that really provides good linkage between these other protected areas and the TNC lands. It combats fragmentation. But this is the map that we were given to make the, the decision upon, the protected areas and the beige background. And as a landscape ecologist, I thought that background is probably not entirely beige. So if you go to the USGS land cover information, here is the area that is being proposed. And without going into the details of what this shows, it shows that you have a variety of land uses and land covers in the surroundings. You can also simply go to your computer and pull up Google Earth and find a Google Earth image. Here is this area that is being posed, proposed for protection. And under this, you get a pretty good impression of it. You see things that you don't see in the other map. And in particular, you see what the land cover is 
in the surrounding areas. And of course with Google Earth you can zoom in and out, so you can zoom out and it gives you yet a different perspective on this area. Here in fact is the conservation area and you can see now that that really is a remnant block, of a fairly large block of forest in a landscape that has otherwise been intensely fragmented as most of this part of Western Maryland and West Virginia has been fragmented. That puts a different perspective on the potential conservation value of that parcel. So having that kind of land cover information is really critical. Knowing the context in which the protected areas sit is important for judging their immediate conservation and knowing how that land cover is likely to change over time is also very important. Another direction that we're headed in terms of thinking about protected areas, land purchases, is to look at it in terms of return on investment. Um, how much are you getting for your dollar investment in buying places and protecting them and putting them under conservation easements? This again are the set of eco-regions for the northeastern United States. And with Steve Pulaski at the University of Minnesota, we've done some analysis, very simple back of that envelope analysis, taking county level land prices uh, for these areas and comparing them with the lists for, in this case, plant species richness for these ecoregions. And then you can simply calculate how much plant species richness are you getting per million dollars expenditure on areas. And these are the, these are the numbers along the side and the numbers in parentheses are the rank out of the 21 ecoregions in the uh, temperate broadleaf forest in North America. Quite variable. Um, some of them you get a high return on investment, some of them low. It doesn't mean that here in areas in the Northeast where land values are very high in relationship to the plant species diversity, doesn't mean that you shouldn't be protecting areas there. But you may want to think if you have an option between spending money in one area and spending it in another area, this may be the kind of information you want to take into account. <coughs> At this scale, it may not be very useful, but trying to import return on investment models and return on investment thinking and building more parameters into those models may enable us to be much smarter in terms of how we prioritize our expenditures at a much more local level. If we have a choice between buying this part land parcel over here and another land parcel that's only a few miles away and they seem to be equivalent, what's the return on investment between the two if we can only buy one? And even if we can only buy, if we could buy two, does it still make sense? Is it a bad return on investment? We need to begin thinking in much more business-like terms, much more economic terms, to see how we best use the limited conservation resources that we have. We're also beginning to expand the perspectives of conservation to include, as I said, to include people in their activities, but to include explicitly the goods and services that natural systems provide to people which are not explicitly valued. They're not marketed in some way, so-called ecosystem services. So from freshwater systems, for example, people can obtain subsistence in the terms of fishing. Uh, in many parts of the world, they obtain their water from these systems. Hydroelectric power from these systems. Transportation, recreation. Uh, I might point out that that's me. <coughs> Um, and it, you can see that I'm not particularly enthused about this particular value of this ecosystem at this point in time. This, on the other hand, is my daughter, who seems to be really valuing the experience. And we talked after this particular episode about the ecosystem services valuation that we would both place on this. We did an economic return on investment analysis uh, and uh, as is always the case, she won. <laughs> the economist is recognizing this. So it, this kind of thinking, what are the other economic values of ecosystems? The kinds of things that we haven't been factoring into standard kind of economic cost-benefit 
uh, valuations of places. What are they and how can we begin to think about these? This is the way I tend to conceptualize this in terms of ecosystem services system. Over here we really have the ecosystems, the services, the biodiversity, the ecosystem functions that produce those services. This is essentially the production part of an ecosystem service system. This is the consumption part, the benefits that those services provide to people, how people value those services. And in particular, we can look at this valuation, uh, which can be through direct market valuation. How much are you willing to pay for timber? How much are you willing to pay for the clean water that comes off of a forested watershed? How much can you pay for the carbon that is sequestered by forests? So on, the pollination uh, values. The policy component of valuation, which can be a way of setting those values and establishing them. And the cultural values, which can't be ignored. This is an example from some work done in, in Canada's boreal forest on ecosystem service valuation. Here's what's happening to the boreal forest region in Canada. All of this red represents areas that have been fragmented by industrialization of one form or another, usually forestry. And you can see that, that if you were to look at this over a time series, that red is steadily creeping north at an alarming rate. The vast boreal forest that we tend to think of being a reservoir of conservation and undisturbed is being eaten away. And some people in Canada have done an analysis of the uh, market valuation of the boreal forest uh, resources, both the direct uh, market values as we think of them in terms of timber, but the other kinds of values in terms of hydroelectric power, uh, clean water, uh, recreational uses, and the like that come from that. And these are the values that they come up with, $48, $49 billion Canadian uh, per year in, in 2002. Uh, some costs that are associated with that in terms of carbon emissions, um, water pollution, things of that sort. So the net market value is still fairly high. When one looks at the non-market values, those non, uh, the values that are not marketed, that have not explicit economic values, they're considerably higher. And in fact, the ratio of the non-market to the market values in this, something on the order of 2.5 to 1. You can quibble about the analysis, although this is an exceptionally thorough analysis, but it's clear from this analysis that those non-market values, the non-current market values of ecosystems, far outstrip those that we are directly factoring in to our current economic models. And therefore, if we're going to think about conservation of these systems, in some sense, we need to play the game the way the business community is playing the game to play it in terms of economics, to uh, begin to portray to the public, to the users of these services, that while we may think of them as free, they have value, and they are not ultimately free. And ultimately, in one way or another, we are paying for those services, and we need to recognize that and build it in to the economic models that we use. Paul Arrington had something to say about this. He noted that native predators belong in our natural outdoor scenes not so much because they have a postulated or demonstrated monetary value or utility in the so-called balance of nature as because they are, it seems to me, a manifestation of life's wholeness. That captures that cultural value of the goods and services that are produced by ecosystems, by predators in this case. Ecosystem services also relate to human well-being and poverty in many parts of the world. And to see how this relates, you can look at this map, which overlays areas of human, low human development, in other words, the impoverished areas, the poverty-riddled areas of the world, with areas of high biodiversity. And the areas of dark green are the areas in which poverty and biodiversity richness coincide with one another. This is yet another way that one could use to prioritize conservation activities if you factor in the ecosystem services and the degree to which ecological systems foster biodiversity and at the same sense can contribute to human well-being. 
It suggests that there are some parts of the world that are particularly ripe for conservation efforts that links together poverty, human well-being, and biodiversity protection. This is another way of looking at it. You can begin to play games forever with the kinds of maps that are now available. This is the failed states in index. This is a measure in a <coughs> sense of the degree to which the political and economic stability of a country or their growth rates is threatened. And these bright red areas are the areas that really, according to the Fund for Peace, are the failed states. Those are areas that arguably are ripe for conservation effort, in which the human condition is arguably most imperiled, but they are also those places in which it is likely to be most difficult to achieve conservation results. They're the most difficult places to, to work in because there is warfare going on there, because the political apparatus is corrupt and any money that goes into conservation is going to be siphoned off by the political systems. There are some realities there that also affect where conservation can be most effectively pursued. So when we go back to this kind of diagram of how we use conservation planning and conservation science to inform conservation action, that's how we used to do things. And to a degree, we still do it. And to a degree, it works. But it's clear that we need to pull in these realities, <coughs> the social, political, and economic realities of those places in which we try to do conservation. And this becomes all the more important as we expand our view globally. Um, I'm a scientist, so I tell my role in the conservancy is to foster science. So I try to think a lot about how we bring science to bear on conservation. This is the traditional way we've thought about the linkage between science and conservation. The basic science in the ivory or not so ivory towers produces the knowledge, produces the insight, and it's expressed then in applied science and eventually in conservation action. And there's a smooth and orderly flow of information from one to the other so that what we see at this end is fully informed by what is being discovered at this end, albeit with some time lags. That's how people would have you believe things operate. And now, in fact, scientists have tended to promote what they do as being valuable to the real world. This is what it's like. Uh, there's a gap there. You're reminded of that gap if you go to England and see mm -hmm. these signs all over the place. And the challenge, therefore, is how do we bridge that gap between science, even applied science, which goes on in many of the universities, which has journals that publish that. I've commented to several people today that the journal Conservation Biology contains, I mean, it's a fat journal that contains a lot of conservation science, a lot of good conservation science. If you look at what, what of that is reaching the conservation practitioners, is translated into conservation action, or affects conservation action, almost none of it. You can look at that journal and say, most of it's irrelevant to what goes on in the real world. Maybe it's not ultimately irrelevant, but it is irrelevant in practice because we can't cross that gap. Basic scientists tend to think this way about the problem. <laughs> Conservation action is quite different, and that affects it. Uh, the British essayist C.P. Snow, decades ago, drew attention to the two-culture problem. He was thinking of the gap between science and the arts and humanities. He expressed it in this way, that. Greenwich Village talks precisely the same language as Chelsea, both areas of Boston, and both have about as much communication with MIT as though the scientists spoke nothing but Tibetan. But there was this, in other words, this communication gap. They were parts of two cultures that were totally separate from one another. And his thesis was that those, there was a fundamental cultural shift and it would be almost impossible to bridge that gap. I think the same kind of gap exists between science and application. And I think there are a number of reasons why. One is that science, whether it's basic or applied science, tends to focus on hypothesis testing and experiments. That's the way science is done. If you want to get your stuff published, if you want to get grants, that's how you do it. You don't do it intuitively. You don't do it with ad hoc comparisons. 
And yet the real world of conservation is intuitive. It's ad hoc comparisons. Basic science focuses on very small graspable pro problems, things that you can solve in a grant cycle, things that a graduate student can solve in a period of less than eight or ten years. Um, <laughs> you, the communication is still largely within those cultures. You look at the meetings and the people who go to the meetings. And yes, there's some overlap, but hardly any. Those conservation practitioners, <coughs> people who are actually taking the conservation actions, they don't go to the science meeting. They go to the land trust alliance meetings. They go to other meetings like that. They don't communicate with one another. And the reward system is totally different. Scientists, basic or applied, are rewarded for getting grants and publishing. Getting grants and publishing is largely irrelevant to people doing conservation work. Getting money is relevant, but they don't get it through grants. They go to the sources of the money, the big corporate people who make the money, and cut out the middleman, the, the NSF, in which the money has to be filtered through the taxpayer and through the federal government and all of, of that. But mostly, they don't publish. Nobody's asking them to publish. That's not the reward. The reward is the conservation accomplishments and going from one accomplishment to another. And it is hard to argue with that. But as long as you have these vast differences in reward systems, it makes it very difficult to bridge the gap. So this is what we're faced with. You know, and I could say, you know, this is another picture of me trying desperately to bridge that gap. And I don't know what the solution to it is, but it is something that really affects modern day conservation. I charted an outline for you of where conservation was in terms of its focus on species, protected areas, how that has evolved in various ways. And throughout, I've tried to impress upon you the importance of having the science foundation for that. But we're still left with this gap and this difficulty of bridging the gap. So I want to end again by quoting Paul Arrington. I emphasize both the importance of regarding predation with understanding and balance and the importance of safeguarding as much as we can of age-tested of age naturalness of life's wholeness in an increasingly man-dominated world. Life's wholeness, that was a key part of Paul Arrington's message. And I think that's something that has been to some degree forgotten as conservation has focused increasingly upon individual species, upon places isolated from their landscape surroundings. If we're going to think of life's wholeness, it has to be the wholeness of ecological systems. And yes, the world is a man or human dominated uh, world. We can't deny that. So life's wholeness includes that as well. The new conservation agenda has to include people not as threats to biodiversity, but I think really as a part of the biodiversity we're trying to protect. So I'll end that with the obligatory sunset <laughs> sign. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. We have a lot of different criteria that the Nature Conservancy is using to prioritize these actions. But you didn't mention anything about the fact that we haven't saved the species unless you save the land that it's going to have to move to as the earth forms up. So is that being factored in any way in the population? I'm going to talk some about that tomorrow. I could kind of put off your question that way. Um, but no, I think clearly climate change is uh, an influence that um, casts a pall on all of this. And if we're going to do conservation planning, we need to be looking ahead to do exactly what you say, to, to look at how systems are going to change, how our organisms are going to be able to move with changing environments? Are we creating the pathways that enable mobility for things that can move? Uh, we also need to look at how places are going to change and adapt to those changes that may be inevitable, that may be beyond our management. So if we buy an area now thinking that we are preserving one thing, 
we need to be looking ahead to say, what are we going to be preserving 20 or 50 years, serving 20 or 50 years, serving 20 or 50 years, 